Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 140 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltaka. Thanks for joining me again today on the show. We've got uh, tons of news. It seems like every single episode, as you know, like when we when we do a podcast and then for the next, what well, whatever, right, two weeks, what I do is I start taking notes every time I think of something that I should put on the podcast. And towards, you know, in the beginning of that whole process, I'm like, oh man, it doesn't look like there's going to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but there always is, right? <laughs> At least with these liberals. I don't know. You know what? If there was an election and the liberals were defeated like completely, you know, this is sort of my fantasy, right? And they were they were diminished to 34 seats like they were a few election cycles ago where they deserve to be, as le- at least this group of liberals. You know, I don't even know what we would talk about because everything would be a lot better. And there just wouldn't be... Because you, you tend to talk about the negative things because those are the things that we want to work towards changing. We wouldn't just wouldn't have that much to do. I don't know what I would do then. Maybe I would have a life. So anyway, lots of news to talk about. Uh, the Mass Casualty Commission came out with their final report. We'll talk about that. We did a video about it already. So we, we're having a, a condensed conversation because so, I don't want to bore you. Um, I also have an interview with Jerrica Janot, who has a new show on Wild TV called Jerrica in the Wild. And so um, this is the uh, interview that was uh, that is airing in the next CCFR or CCFR radio on the air episode on wild TV. So I'm going to show that uh, to you. And then I've got a couple of other things to go through uh, before that gets all done. Anyway, let's talk about the companies that help the CCFR radio podcast continue going. A big thank you to our friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers chapter of Safari Club International. They do a lot of great work over there, including supporting the CCFR. So make sure you check them out at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com and Vortex, the force of optics. We'd like to thank our friends over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support the podcast and providing great products. You can check all that out at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. And to our friends over at CTOMS. CTOMS Academy provides life-saving training in trauma care and human performance. Perfect for outdoor enthusiasts, for hunters, for shooters. You can check them out at ctomsinc.com. That's ctomsinc.com. All right, we're back. So I just want to talk about how this um, this episode is going to unfold. I've got a couple of things I need to go over with you right now. Then I will play the interview I did with J- uh, Jerrica Janot from Jerrica in the Wild on Wild TV. Brand new show. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, and then I'll play the interview I just recorded with Wilson. I think it's about 15 minutes, so it's not too bad. And then I've actually got some more information um, and uh, some topics to discuss with you at the end. So if you make it through the end, that's great. I would do it now, but I don't want to bore you. Me yapping the whole time. Okay, first thing, uh, CCFR versus Canada. We're getting our day in court, or our eight days to be exact. Um, and it's next week, April 11th through the 20th is our court dates. Three years and two plus million dollars later. You know, we really hammered the government on this more in, in, in a grander style than ever before in Canadian history on behalf of gun owners. So we really took it to them. And I just want to say thank you to all of you that supported this thing, because that's really what it takes to get the government to, to take notice, to actually change the way they behave. It takes, it takes a legal effort like that, right? Not just, you know, oh, we, have, we filed an application, fundraised on it, and just sat and let, it, let the government do whatever it wanted, you know, not um, cross-examine any of their affiants, just whatever, and just show up at the end and be like, oh, we won, we lost, I don't know. Probably lose, right? So anyway, I, as a gun owner, I couldn't have done that by myself. As gun owners, you probably couldn't have done it by yourselves if you're just regular people like me. So, but together we were able to do it. So I just, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's contributed to that and has stuck with us. It's been three years. Man, it's a long haul. And that case was a lot of work for us, <laughs> like a lot of work, not just for the legal team, like for us as individuals. So anyway, thank you for that. We're getting there, right? So we, so we should see a, a decision somewhere in July or August, we're hoping. And then we'll find out all these different questions. It was a big case with a lot of questions. So we'll, we'll have a lot of answers, whether we like the answers or not. We're going to have them. All right, next thing I want to talk about real quick is uh, this Trudeau versus Pierre Polyev clip that was circulating around on social media um, this past week. It was really something. 
right? So it's Pierre Polyev taking the, the liberals to task for their mess and their violent crime wave that's raging across Canada. If you've been watching the news, like you've seen it, like stabbings and in Starbucks in downtown Vancouver. My kids live in downtown Vancouver. My kids go to Starbucks. So anyway, this I'm going to show you this clip. I'm enough talking. I'm going to show you this clip. It's heavily edited, but you can see the whole clip um, by going to the uh, House of Commons website, go into the uh, publication search, put in Pierre Polyev's name, just start writing Pierre. It'll pop up there, his name, and just put stabbing. And you'll, you know, in the search, in the additional criteria, and you'll find the video. You can watch it yourself, okay? But anyway, check it out. We'll talk about it in a second. The last three days in Canada, Saturday night, a 16-year-old boy stabbed to death at a Toronto subway in an unprovoked attack by a repeat offender. Sunday evening, a father stabbed to death outside of Vancouver Starbucks with his wife and daughter present. Sunday night, a man stabbed on a Toronto City bus and taken to hospital. Monday night, uh, a sub sergeant, a police officer, killed in near La trois rivieres And in the early morning uh, of this day, a young girl shot to death in Calgary. This is part of the 32% increase in violent crime since the Prime Minister took office. Will he reverse the policies that caused that? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we are, like all Canadians, deeply concerned with some of the very uh, heinous crimes that we've seen over the past uh, number of days. The increase uh, in violent attacks on innocent Canadians. The opposition. People are tired of hearing about his concern. They want to know what he's going to do to reverse the damage he's caused. But if the member opposite was really serious about moving forward on keeping communities safe, he'd back our upcoming Bill 21 at third reading to make sure that we're keeping uh, assault weapons out of the hands uh, of people across this country, that we're strengthening gun control uh, to freeze handguns, that we're continuing to move forward instead of being in the pockets of the NRA to focus on Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Unbelievable. He thinks that a hunter in Nunavut is responsible for the stabbings in downtown Vancouver. When we were in office in the last year, there was 124,000 fewer violent crimes than there was last year. Violent crime, including murders, have skyrocketed under this policy of this Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite himself brought up what they did under the Harper government uh, in those years. What they did was loosen Let's gun control laws. Let's what they did was make it easier uh, for people to buy assault-style weapons. And that led to direct increases in gun ownership and, unfortunately, in violent crime across the country. All right, so that clip was a little long. It was about two, two minutes and eight seconds. Um, it was heavily edited. I put the, those, you know, those white flashes in the edit. So those are called dip to white. I put those in there so you know exactly where I cut it. It's well worth watching the full clip um, because it's just very instructive. So there's a couple of issues that I have other than with the whole thing, I guess. But there's this incredible crime wave going across Canada. It's not all the Liberals' fault, but a lot of it is. It's their policies. And um, a lot of these people that are committing these terrible violent acts are out on bail like one night in jail for like literally shooting up the streets, like shooting a, like think about that, right? I think we get desensitized. Shooting a handgun in the middle of the city. Like, do you, you know, you know what I mean? Like, can you, as a gun owner, can you imagine that? Discharging a handgun in the middle of the city, shooting at some other dude and he's shooting at you. Bullets like literally flying. It's, it's beyond comprehension for, for a licensed gun owner. But that's what they're out on bail for doing, and then they do it again. <laughs> you know, like some of these criminals, if you watch the clip, the full ones, like some of these criminals have been arrested 150 times in a year for violent offenses. So anyway, all that to say, the only defense of the liberals is, you know, you know oh, it's so rich for you to talk about violent crime when you won't support a gun ban on only licensed gun owners. Like just, just the, the, the gymnastics, the, the intellectual, the mental gymnastics required. So, and then even when that's not working, and this is one of the other big problems, so there's, there's two more. Um, one is obviously you don't agree with, you know, taking, banning all guns from only licensed individuals. So obviously you're in the pockets of the NRA. So you are under foreign influence as a political party. Isn't that interesting for the liberals to say, right? But that NRA thing, the weakest, most ineffective, unremarkable people use that one. And like the docs do that all the time. NRA inspired, NRA, 
you know, talking points. Oh, the NRA style, the NRA supported, all this stuff. Like that's, that's all they have. And why do they say these things? Is there any indication whatsoever that a single Canadian politician has gotten a dollar from the NRA in the United States? There's, the NRA has, NRA has zero to gain by involving itself in Canadian politics, like nothing. Like we can't even get guns with 18 and a half bar inch barrels because US manufacturers are like, yeah, it's not worth it. You guys are nothing. You're like one state in the United States, you know? And, and what benefit would it have for a group like ours or the conservatives to have any relationship with the NRA? There's like nothing there. And the reason why, and they all know that, and the reason why they do that is because they want people to hate us. They want people to hate the conservatives. They don't care if it's real. They want to spread hate and disinformation. That's exactly what it is. All that coming from the government that says, we have to censor the internet and censor your ability, it, you know, um, uh, impact your ability to, to, you know, to find what you want online because we need to manage hate and disinformation. Like, it's just crazy, right? So anyway, that has real life consequences because I see it not every day, probably twice a week online. You're, you're funded by the NRA. And it's like, that is like literal disinformation propagated by Justin Trudeau and the rest of the liberal party, the actual sitting government of a G7 nation. It is wild when you start to think about it. And then the last thing that I had a problem, like is so much garbage, like so much sin <laughs> in that in that exchange is wild. Just so much uh, terrible behavior is they're talking about like Stephen Harper made assault weapons easier to get. It's like, well, there wasn't much gun control back then and Canada was way safer than it is now. You've rolled out all this gun control and Canada's never been more dangerous, not since the 70s. Interesting, right? But anyway, that's not what the, what the conservatives did. Never made assault weapons legal or easy to get. That's completely untrue. Again, total lies and disinformation, intentional disinformation. Anyway, I just, that clip was really, really impactful. And it just shows what a, what a really difficult situation we are in Canada right now that we're in, I should say, in Canada right now. If you get a chance to vote, do not miss that opportunity. This has to stop and it has to stop soon. Anyway, sorry to get y'all wound up, but it's just, this, man, these liberals never take a day off of this stuff. It's really something. All right, let's lighten it up a little bit. Um, we're going to go to that interview with uh, Jerrica Jeannot from Jerrica in the Wild. All right, we're back via Skype. We've got Jerrica Jeannot from the new series on WOW TV, Jerrica in the Wild. How are you, Jerrica? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing, Rod? I'm squeaking by, thank you. <laughs> um, so very exciting. You've got your own nationally broadcast uh, hunting show. So that's got to be awesome, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's a little nerving, but I'm, I'm really excited. Um, you know, it's we've been working on it for a couple of months now, and I'm excited to actually see it come to fruition. I hope everybody really loves it. But uh, yeah, being on TV is super new. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an adjustment period. So um, by trade, you're a nurse. Um, I am. And at the same time, you're an outdoors person. Yes. So there's there's something kind of unique about the show that you're creating right there, uh, obviously. Uh, but what exactly... What, what are you doing with your show if it's like, is it just a regular hunting show or what are you doing that's different maybe than anything else that's on TV right now? So definitely not a regular hunting show. Um, I'm a late to the game hunter. So I didn't actually start hunting until I was in my 30s. Um, it was something that I, I started doing after I got sick and I really wanted to get into it. I've been involved with hunting people my whole life. My dad hunts, you know, like I come from a family of hunters and trappers, um, but I never did it on my own. And it was something that I really wanted to be able to do to uh, be able to provide for my family and just kind of like a bucket list thing. So this show, um, I'm not a pro, you know, you see a lot of hunting shows where people are out there and they're like professional hunters. They're doing all these amazing things. I'm learning. So I'm actually taking people with me as I learn certain things. Um, also showing you guys some of the knowledge that I've acquired over time, uh, be it modern technique, traditional technique, going with different cultures, different hunters, different lifestyles, just all over the country and kind of showing you guys some different methods. And uh, also it's very field to table. So not only am I showing you guys the actual hunting process, but I also show you processing the animal, 
um, what I do with the hides, what I do with the meat, some cooking, again, the foraging aspect of it. So it's a little bit of everything. And then you also get an inside look at my family. So I have six kids and um, you get to see a little bit of that, a little bit of my clinic, a little bit of uh, the teaching and charity work that I do. I'm kind of all over the place. So it's um, a hunting and lifestyle show showing my chaotic existence. <laughs> well, that's I, I think that's awesome. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really to, excited. Yeah, it's always good to add a little little more to um, to, to these shows where it's not just, you know, you're sitting in the bush, you're like, okay, there it is, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know that kind of thing. And yeah. I watch a few hunting shows and I find them to be, be relaxing and gets me away from politics for sure. But um, being able to, like for somebody that's a non-hunter, being able to understand how to hide an animal, how to, I don't, I don't think they show field dressing on TV, but just, no, just no. how to process a lot of the other stuff would be valuable, like at least to somebody like me. I think it's really good too, because it's showing people how to utilize all of the animal, which is a really important part to me ethically, um, to use as much as I can and have no waste. So showing people what to do so that they're not wasting those parts of the animal or even what they can do in terms of donating it to people who can use it, uh, just so that they feel as though they are utilizing as much as they can, which to me as a hunter is very important. Yeah. Um, you know, you're also working, uh, speaking of the shows, you're working with a, a friend of mine, Corey Levitt. Uh, who was involved in producing the second season of the CCFR's uh, Canada Downrange and uh, a lot of other projects that we've done with Corey. But Corey's really, really good. And the stuff that he, uh, that he um, produces is excellent. So it's, it's kind of exciting that you're working with Corey. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. I'm sure that he's probably sick of me right now, <laughs> um, you know, because again, I'm new to the game and he's very experienced. It shows in his work. He's phenomenal. I've watched a lot of the shows that he's produced and it's just incredible the things that he's able to put out. So I know he's going to do the show justice. Um, I have watched a couple of the episodes and I'm so, so impressed with the way that he was able to bring our idea and make it work. You know, like he's been phenomenal and very, very important in this entire process. So I'm super thankful for him. And I'm hoping that we're able to continue producing this together and that we're going to make some magic. Yeah, that's awesome. So when, like, do you, is it airing now or when does it oh, air? Or? The first episode airs tonight, actually. Um, I believe it's March 29th. So uh, Wednesday it airs at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then it airs again on Thursday, I believe at 11.30, Friday at 2.30, and Sunday at 6.30. And that's all Eastern Standard Time across the board. That's uh, very exciting. So th this show lags kind of the podcast by a week. So when people are watching this now, it's it'll already be in rotation. Yes, yes. So there's a new episode every other week. So they'll still be able to watch the first episode next week when this uh, podcast does air. Um, but yeah, so, and we have four air times during the week, so you should be able to catch it. And then I'm also going to be having it available on a Patreon platform that I will make available to people on my social media. That's awesome. Um, now you're involved with a lot of different things, not just the television <laughs> show and not just having six kids and owning your own clinic. Um, but you're, in, in, you're, um, involved in some charitable causes or various ones over the, uh, across the past. What, uh, what yes. are some of the things that you're involved so, in? You know, since I became a clinic owner and just being involved in my community, I've always really wanted to make sure that I had a way to give back. Um, it's really important to me being that I know where I came from. I wasn't always at the same level of privilege that I'm at now. So I like to give back to different programs. I've worked with women's shelters, mental health facilities. Um, I've worked with a lot of indigenous causes, and that is primarily where my focus is now is helping different indigenous communities with different, um, you know, issues that are going on, be it where it's the water boil advisories or maybe the homeless population. So I actually have an organization called the Falling Leaves Festival, where I do um, a fundraiser every year and donate those proceeds to an indigenous based cause. Um, this year, we're still in the works of how that's going to look. But last year, we donated to Kettle and Stony Point First Nation. And the year prior to that was Chippewa of the Thames First Nation. So um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. I love that people are excited to get involved. It's a great way to learn about some of the important things that are going on that you may not hear about in mainstream media. And it's just really important to me to be able to give back. Awesome. Um, okay. We're out of time. So where can people find you? Um, we talked about how they can catch the show, but where do they find you online? So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, all Jerrica in the wild. My name is spelled J E R R I K A. And then just in the wild, just exactly how it sounds. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and we'll, uh, we'll have you on again. Yeah. I'm super excited. Thanks for having me.
All right, via Skype, we've got Tracy Wilson of the CCFR. Wilson! That was a really good one. It almost sounds Flintstone-like when you do it like that. Yeah. It's a <laughs> Wilma! It, it's almost Wilma, yeah. Yeah, all I like it. All right, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, so we might as well get started right away. Uh, the big right. news uh, is the Mass Casualty Commission has, um, has come out with their final report uh, $30 million later and almost three years later. And um, if you've, you and I did a video a couple of days ago when the report first mm -hmm. came out, um, it's about 15 minutes, probably worth watching, although it's pretty rambly. And I think I went on a bit of a four minute tirade there because um, <laughs> it's as in all of your most cynical nightmares of what this would turn out to be. It, it actually is exactly that. So it was, uh, yeah. anyway, I apologize for my, uh, my ranting, but <laughs> anyway, why don't you uh, why don't you give us just a quick overview? We'll kick it back and forth and move on to something else. Yeah, so this is a huge report, actually, and there's a lot of parts of it that are really important and probably a lot of measures uh, that are worth looking at, such as RCMP response to what happened over that you know tragic day and a half, and of course the emergency alert system. People weren't really advised what was going on, and that's a major problem because it probably cost some lives. So there's some lessons learned uh, to be learned there. But what we were more interested in, of course, was the recommendations as far as the access to firearms. So that was a, a total, you know, separate section on its own. And again, in that video, there's a, a whole bunch of things that we list. But there are two main concerns that came out of that was, number one, a complete free pass to Bill Blair and former RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky for their alleged political interference into the um, the investigation. Of course, you will remember back then they wanted to um, have the information about what guns he used released because it sort of complemented their upcoming um, gun ban that they were trying to introduce. So that was that was that's wild to me that they got a free pass. And then the other thing was almost word for word the amendments that were withdrawn from C21, G4, and G46, almost word for word, they're in there. Like, shockingly close. It, there's no way it's a coincidence. And the idea that suggesting a full ban on semi-automatic handguns, rifles, and shotguns to legal owners would have had any effect on mitigating what happened in this horrible tragedy is absolutely false. There was also, um, they relied really heavily on anti-gun lobbyist information, an Australian prof, uh, professor, and totally ignored uh, the Canadian data and the Canadian experts that we have here, like Dr. Kaylin Langman, who's a you know, very respected, very published expert on these issues. So he was denied access to testify before them or submit. So yeah, I think we need a public inquiry into the public inquiry. Yeah, well, you know, they, they let uh, Ralph Brown, a historian from Nova Scotia, get in there. I think he's from Nova Scotia. I don't really know. He's from I think out there so. someplace. And then an actual emergency room physician that has four peer-reviewed studies on e the exact data that we needed to make an evaluation in this commission. They didn't let him uh, get into, you know, just, it just, and, and, you know, it's funny because, so I, I got a couple of things I just want to add really quick. So sure. it's funny because we're criticized for saying, you know, hey, we're taking part in this commission or whatever. And then as soon as the report comes out, it's like, oh, this is garbage and, you know, propaganda or whatever, right? Like Paulie was saying those things. And I think that's, there's, it's a, it's a point worth exploring. Well, that's because we are <laughs> adults over here and we participated and did the best that we possibly could. We participated in good faith. You know, we didn't, I didn't approach being a participant there is like, yeah, well, this is just going to be a sham anyway. It's like, well, that's not the way to approach it. You you assume goodness first and good faith. And then when you get to the end, you can see whether or not your suspicions were correct or not, right? So that's how right. that works for those that are a little bit um, maybe uh, more simple-minded. Um, and I think <laughs> the the big thing that we you know, that people need to understand about this inquiry, uh, going back to the two things, number one, in my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, so who cares what I think, but it, the, Brenda Lucky and Bill Blair, clearly, it was clearly political interference. They, Brenda Lucky, and one of the two of them, I think, lied too, if I remember correctly, that, like, oh, I never said anything. About that. I never pressured anybody to release the firearm information before all the victims were actually found. Turns out, yeah, that the, there was a phone call. Yeah, there's a recording. Evidence, yeah, evidence surface. Like, yeah, you totally did that. And you totally mm -hmm. pressured your people to release that information. And you totally referenced the liberals' upcoming gun ban. 
Like it's cut and yeah. dry in my opinion, but whatever. It's like, well, yeah, give these people a free pass. Who cares? What are you going to do about it? It seems to be the attitude. And then as far as the commissions, yeah, I'm ranting again, I know, but just let me get, let me get through it. But, and then as far as the commission's uh, mission was, it was to figure out how to stop this from happening again, or what could, what we could have, could have happened to stop this particular situation. And, right. you know, I wrote a couple points. I just want to make sure that this is never lost on anyone. Okay. These are the facts of the Nova Scotia spree shooting that happened back on April 18th and 19th, 2020. Okay. This individual, the perpetrator was on the police radar for more than a decade. He was a nut, a violent, um, spousal abusing nut. Okay. People moved out of the community just to get away from them because they knew he was going to blow at one. There was even all, there was even an RCMP officer who was to investigate him became his buddy and they stayed in contact on a friendly basis. Like there's a lot wrong there. He didn't have a mm -hmm. firearms license. He had no connections whatsoever to the legal firearms community or the licensing system whatsoever. He took the Canadian firearm safety course and never even applied for a license after that. Like that's as close as he ever got. So he was completely outside the legal system in Canada. And he smuggled all of his firearms that were used in these offenses from the United States. Right, every firearm that he used in this offense was smuggled from the United States. So, and he had a Nexus pass. On top of that, and his on top of all his numerous uh, interactions with police. So, Nexus is supposed to be a zero tolerance program. Somehow, this time it wasn't. The whole thing stinks. And you know, now the report is just used as yeah, passed um, the Liberals C twenty one bill. Uh, bring in the Australians. They know about what's going on in Canada. And and, uh, and it's funny because I, and I know I'm going on, but I did have that interaction. I got to question the uh, Australian professor and he couldn't tell me one thing in his submissions that would have played a part in stopping this situation. Not one. And I'll put a, a, a link in the description uh, as well for that, that um, my cross-examination of him. But it's like, if we were able to cross-examine these people, like we did in the MCC, a lot more people would understand a lot more what's going on here. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I mean, I hope there are some, um, you know, some good changes uh, towards emergency alert responses and RCMP stuff. But I have a feeling that although this report is non-binding, the part that the liberals will be rubbing their hands over are, of course, the um, recommendations for more gun bans against legal owners. Yeah, it's an opportunity yeah. for them, right? It's got, this, it sure that's is. all these people view it as is an opportunity. Yeah. Get our gun ban through. You know, this is this is this is our ticket right here. Like, this, these are not yeah. good people, man. Anyway, no. all right. Uh, enough about that. Um, wanted to address the restructuring going on at the CCFR. So we've grown <laughs> unmanageably in the last year or two, <laughs> and we were still working with the same infrastructure. I think I talked about this in the last podcast or the one before that. And one of the one of the things that we are way behind on in everything that we're doing is membership cards, like four months behind. Yeah, so unmanageable is is probably a good way to put it. So uh, we've grown in in leaps and bounds, but we've still been operating with the same amount of staff. That's been corrected. We've hired a couple of new people. Um, we are probably about two thirds of the way through working through that four month backlog of membership cards. I know people are really excited waiting for them. I appreciate your patience and I'm going to ask for just a little bit more, but those will be out soon, probably within the next four weeks. So we will get caught up. I apologize for getting behind. I know they mean a lot to the people who are waiting for them and your support means a lot to us. So just hang in there. We're almost caught up. And then going forward, um, you know, we'll be a lot more timely and prepared for these kinds of things. Yeah, we're going to be doing runs every two weeks from now yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. So we have <laughs> we have people <laughs> dedicated to doing those things now, whereas yeah. that those tasks were sta were tacked on to Staffer Steve stuff, and Staffer Steve has a four page list of things that he's responsible for, and of course you and I are running like maniacs all day long. So it's yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, like you said, we're getting that uh, we're getting our our infrastructure. Um, to the point where it can support an organization uh, as big as we are now. So that's great. Um, okay, so, uh, Saskatchewan is coming out with their uh, new Saskatchewan Firearms Act. 
Yeah, so this bill was actually tabled in Saskatchewan back in December in response to the Liberals' ongoing war against gun owners. And uh, it looks like for, uh, Thursday morning that bill will be passed. So that's great. So a big congratulations to Premier Scott Moe, to Saskatchewan CFO Robert Freeberg, and Public Safety Minister Christine Tell. So I know it's been a lot of work. Um, it means a lot to the people that are affected. Congratulations to Saskatchewan gun owners for having a, a, a provincial government that's looking out for your interests and defending you against uh, federal government overreach. And yeah, I look forward to seeing how that um, helps Saskatchewan gun owners. And it's just nice to see these provinces stacking up behind each other in opposition to this continued attack. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's fantastic. And of course, Alberta is hot on the heels of that as well. So that's good oh, news. Yes. Yeah, we may all have to flee to Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, Maybe. <laughs> Uh, okay, last thing on our list is the uh, annual general meeting, the AGM reminder. Um, so I, I know we've been pushing it hard and most people have that information, but in case you don't have that information or you've forgotten about it, um, why don't you give us a quick rundown of what's going on really quickly and uh, how to get your tickets. Absolutely. So you are going to want to be here in Ottawa with us June 9th through 11th, uh, this this upcoming summer, we are going to have an extravaganza of activities. It's all going to start Friday afternoon. You better get yourself to Ottawa, get checked in and get ready because we're going to jump on the shuttle bus and head out to our venue in the east end of the city where we've got basically a rock concert. We've got a live band coming. We're going to whoop it up. We'll have snacks, decorations. It's just going to be a blast. Literally not about work or guns. It's about having fun with the people that mean a lot to us and within our community. You're going to get up and sing the first set. So for those of you who don't know, Rod's an actual rock star, and you're going to prove it on the Friday night. That's not true. You can get home back, to, well, not home, but back to the hotel safely <laughs> um, on that same shuttle. So if you want to have a couple of cocktails, sociables, don't worry about it. We'll make sure you get home safe. Saturday, we've got a full day of activities at the hotel, which is also a conference center. We've got firearms lawyer Ian Runkle uh, from YouTube fame coming to do a talk or a seminar. He, we're going to have all kinds of interesting stuff there. Andrew Lawton from True North is going to talk um, uh, about media and how gun owners can interact with them and how that whole relationship works out. And then you and I are going to do an Ask Me Anything, which is a perfect opportunity to be accountable and transparent with our membership. It's an opportunity for people to sit down with us face to face, ask literally anything they want, and hopefully we're able to give them the answers. We're going to take a quick break, get changed, and then come down for a big gala dinner. And I'm talking prime rib, roast beef, AAA Alberta with all the trimmings. Just anything you can imagine. We're going to feast like kings. And we've got entertainment during dinner. We'll have a comedian. So lots of laughs, lots of good times, lots of sociables. And we've got a professional photo booth. So you'll be able to capture a memento to take home with you to always remember the good time we had. And then Sunday morning, we'll end it off with the business meeting. It's maybe the least exciting part, but it is an obligation to do them. And it's a great opportunity for our members to get reports from every uh, department and, you know, updates on what's going on and what's coming up, as well as financial and legal updates. So, so yeah, it's a whole weekend extravaganza. And of course, we'll ha also have a store on site. So if you've been looking for an opportunity to get some CCFR swag and skip out on paying shipping costs, this is your chance. You can grab your stuff right there. So head on over to firearmrights.ca. There's a story there all about the CCFR AGM. The link is in there to get tickets. The link is in there to get a, a discounted group rate at the hotel. So you can come and stay at the hotel and be there all weekend with us. And we're just going to have a blast. Ottawa in June is beautiful. So come on down. Awesome. All right. So I will, um, if I remember, I, I did write it down though. I'll put a link in the in the description box of this video so that you can go straight to that AGM story on firearmrights.ca and and, uh, and sign up for your tickets. Don't miss it. It's going to be uh, very memorable. It will be. It's going to be a lot of fun. I just, I can't wait. It's and like the, the best time of year. And the photo booth is included, right? Yeah, yeah. It's all included. Yeah. Like there's no charge for that. Perfect. Yeah. So you have free pictures. You, you don't. You're going to eat all weekend, everything. Like, you're you're good. Just yeah. come on down. And you don't have to drink and drive either on the Friday night. So that's great. Yeah. It's all taken care yeah. of. Awesome. All right. 
Thanks for the update, and uh, we'll wrap it up now, and I'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks. All right, we'll see you then. All right, good chat with uh, Wilson. Now, here's what I wanted to cover with you before I let you go. It's an extension of what we were talking about, that exchange between Polyev and Trudeau. And basically what I wanted to expand upon a little bit is if you look at the, the, the clip in its entirety, it's worth it. I think it's around six minutes. You can find it on social media. I didn't, I don't have the whole clip. So I have it, but I didn't upload it as an individual video. So it's, it's floating around everywhere. I think I might've shared it too. And I know Tracy did. So anyway, in there, you see clearly the disinformation that they're intentionally spreading. They're trying to incite hate by saying that they're, you know, the conservatives are, are in the pocket of an American gun lobby group. Like for us, we would have precisely nothing to gain by having any contact whatsoever with the NRA, like nothing. There's, there's nothing in it for us other than in bad exposure. And for the NRA, there's nothing, absolutely nothing in it for them to have any relationship with us. And that's why we've never had any kind of contact whatsoever in the history of the organization, okay? Same thing with the conservatives. There's no reason at all for the NRA to give a dollar to a, 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 a Canadian political party. Like there's just nothing in it for them. Anyway, the, the disinformation and the hate incitement and the division that the, the Liberal Party and all their people, like the ministers, the prime minister, their comms people, and a lot in the mainstream media in Canada, that has real world effects. So I see it on social media at least a couple of times a week. I'll see somebody screaming about the NRA. I talked about that already. I'm not going to get into it. But this that drew my attention to this tweet. So I want to read this tweet for you. Check it out. So Tracy's going back and forth with this guy that made an accusation that we are part of the NRA or whatever it was, right? And she's like, hey, man, you got no, why would you even make that <laughs> accusation if you have no proof at all? And so he says, now this is interesting, and this is what I want to show you. He goes, you know, I admit that I was wrong. Figures, an organization shoving guns down the throats of Canadians would put words in my mouth. You still haven't explained that the gun lobby isn't helped by U.S. groups. So, of course, this is the reverse onus. Where have we seen that before? I make an accusation and you can do all the work to make sure that, uh, that you know, you can prove to me that you didn't do what I imagined you did, right? So, of course, it's worth, these, this is a worthless comment, worthless whole pursuit, right? But the part that was interesting is, an organization that shoves guns down the throats of Canadians. And it's not so much the NRA thing. I get it. Weak people are susceptible to that kind of gaslighting. But if you look at, by extension, the hate. So this guy's been incited to hate, and then he's coming up with a distorted view of reality. You guys are shoving guns down the throats of Canadians. Like, where would that idea ever, where would he ever come up with that idea? Did he watch a bunch of our podcasts? Did he read all of our policies? Did he look at any interviews that we did? Any of that stuff? No. He's got that information from the mainstream media and the, and the Liberal Party and a bunch of anti-gun groups and emergency room doctors, whatever. And now it's like, oh, you're shoving guns down people's throats. You know, and I think it's lost on people. Like, what is it exactly our group wants? And that's what I wanted to get to. It's like, <laughs> we want a reasonable conversation based not on uh, slander and misinformation and defamation, right? We want a conversation based on evidence, not like, oh, my evidence is good, even though it's actually doesn't support my position because, you know, I'm an emergency room doctor, but this other emergency room doctor, you can't, he's connected to the NRA and the conservatives. So his peer reviewed studies, which are actually higher quality data than what I'm offering, you can't, you just can't even consider it because he's, he's, part of the NRA. Like that's where we are in Canada right now. That's the level of the conversation. So what we want is we want gun owners to be treated like the good, hardworking, contributing citizens that they are. Okay. Gun owners are overall exceptional. Criminal record check every day. They have to responsibly um, store, own, and use firearms that can be very dangerous. They're trained for that. They're vetted by the RCMP. They're, they're governed by a wide variety of laws, some of them even unreasonable, but storage and, and transportation laws, they have to know all this stuff and, all, and, and, and um, withstand all the pitfalls, the legal pitfalls of owning firearms in order to just continue with their culture and their identity and their way of life. Like these things are important to gun owners and they have been for hundreds of years long before Canada was a country. We want gun owners 
who abide by the law every single day, obtained that property legally, went jumped through all the hoops and comply every single day to be treated with the respect that any other Canadian is treated with. We want to judge firearm ownership and its relationship or lack thereof with violent crime. We want to look at that through the same lens as we look at everything else, whether it's alcohol or motor vehicles or skydiving or motorcycles or anything. That, like literally that's all we've ever asked for. Just to be honest and to be collaborative and treat people that haven't done anything wrong with, with respect and respect who they are, just like you'd respect anyone else, whether they're LGBTQ, indigenous, women, any other identifiable group. Just treat them with, with the basic dignity of a human being, of a law-abiding, contributing human being. That's what all of this is for. So, you know, and if you look at it, it's like we have conducted ourselves like that. How many times have you all seen, if you paid attention to our social media and everything that we do, have I reached across the aisle to say, hey, all this back and forth can end anytime. I'll forgive and forget like that. It's that what we're talking about is too important to Canadians. It's literally lives are in the balance for us to be fighting with each other. We need to sit down together because we both want the same thing. And how many times have I done that? And I can demonstrate. I just had to dig up all the tweets and all the messages and emails and everything to send it to um, uh, a journalist that's doing a story on the working on the front lines of gun control in Canada. A story about Paulie Sesuvia and how hard it is, how they have it so hard working in, you know, in, in us evil gun lobby, NRA style inspired gun lobby, right? So I'm like, here it is. Here's all the times we said, hey, this is, this is not what this conversation is supposed to be. And you know what we get back is insults. And I sent them all to him. So he's got them. So we'll see what that story looks like. I'll share it with you when, when it comes. It'll probably be another week or two. So anyway, that's all our group ever wanted. So you have the distorted reality that Canadians are under because of the, the absolutely filthy behavior of people like Justin Trudeau and Marco Minichino and Bill Blair and all the rest and many in the media. And the actual reality where we're just like, hey man, <laughs> we're doing everything legal and this is very important to us. Can we, can we get a conversation? Can you listen to us for a couple of minutes? So anyway, I just didn't want that ever lost on anyone. Okay, way too long. How long was I talking? Way too long. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, last housekeeping item. I just want to mention a couple of clubs that have yet come through again for the CCFR. The Hamilton Angling and Hunting Association. Ha ha, right? Remember the story? Ha ha donation. Those guys came again with another donation. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Uh, North Gray Bruce Rod and Gun Club. North Saanich Rod and Gun Club. Thanks, guys. Here we go. Club de Chaise Pesh A Tier de Farnham. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I just, get, I don't know how to say it. I'm sorry, but thank you guys for your support. I really appreciate it. We all really appreciate it. And Vancouver Island Arms Collectors Association. It's not the first time they sent us a significant um, uh, donation. So thank you all. And there were more. Um, I'm trying to keep up with everyone that donates and keep a running list. And there's a big donation coming. We finalized that and I'm going to announce that in the next podcast. Another uh, gun club uh, that is is given us the largest donation uh, in the history of the CCFR. So I want to share that with you next time once that's all done. So anyway, thanks so much, everyone, for your support. Uh, if you want to help us out with the lawsuit or support the CCFR, we got some interesting projects coming up uh, that I'll tell you about soon once they're, uh, the wheels are turning. Uh, but anyway, if you want to support us, you can at firearmrights.ca or you can find us at ccfr.ca. And before you donate or become a member, just click Why Join and find out what it is we have done. We keep a running list so that you know exactly what we do with your support because that's how we operate. Operate. So make sure you do that first. Anyway, thanks for listening. Make sure you share the podcast. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next time.